everybody. Uh, this is uh, let me let me do this at least uh, to speak. Uh, this is a we're learning a lot in this pandemic, and uh, we're learning to expect the unexpected. There you go. Uh, welcome, Mike. Uh, folks are gathering on uh, Zoom and Facebook. Uh, we have a few folks here at the Legion Hall, and, and I expect that that's going to grow as, as time goes by. Uh, just to uh, some introductory comments here is uh, we're, we're doing this today uh, through a hybrid setup. If you were here, and probably we ought to take a picture of all this because uh, this is pretty sophisticated. TC and I have been here since three o'clock, kind of figuring out how this technology works, uh, trying to get all the plugs plugged into the right spot, figure out how we want to do it. Uh, but uh, so thanks to TC, uh, we have an incredible setup here with multiple cameras. We can bring uh, the presentation in and we can hopefully make this experience as good for you uh, online, for you those of you at home, uh, and for those of you who are here. That's our hope. We want everybody to be able to participate. And um, so this is the first time we've done a, a, a presentation with a live speaker since COVID started. So uh, give us a little break as we learn. Uh, but as our intention through the programming is to continue having speakers originate from here, the next two are scheduled to do that. Uh, and uh, we'll talk more about that at the break. Uh, so I, I realize it's a little strange with us uh, gathering uh, both virtually and in, in, in person, but uh, hopefully, we can get by that and ask questions like normal, gather, even though some of our members and friends are, are on the internet uh, and some are here. So uh, if you are on Zoom, if you would really help us by keeping your mic on mute, uh, we'd recommend that you put it on side-by-side uh, -side or speaker view. Uh, please ask clarification clarifying questions. Uh, we, we like the interaction. Uh, you can use chat or uh, take your mic off and mute to ask your questions. Uh, and just be kind of respectful of the pace of the presentation uh, when, you, when you ask. Um, if you are watching on Facebook Live, uh, please interact and uh, share your comments and questions through Facebook. Uh, TC and Bob are both uh, monitoring those and uh, they'll pass them along. Um, if it doesn't seem like they, they ask right away, it might not be the right time in their judgment. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start out like we've always done on our programs and we're gonna do a fly tying demo. And then uh, TC is gonna share some club announcements. And then I'm going to uh, share the presentation. So uh, as we get ready to do this uh, fly tying, um, <clears throat> I want to just introduce that with some, some photos here. Uh, I'm going to be tying tonight a Creel X fly. And the Creel X fly was developed by this guy. His name is Chuck Kraft. Uh, he was a incredible smallmouth guide and an innovative fly tire in the Western Virginia area. And he originated a lot of uh, interesting patterns that smallmouth folks use. Uh, this Creel X was a fly that I was aware of for a long time, but I didn't start fishing it until this this kid in our club started hounding me and saying what a great fly it is. And that, that kid is Chris Walker. And uh, 
he just discovered this fly and wouldn't stop talking about it. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to click through a couple slides here. I'm going to I'm going to tie two versions of the Creolex. Both are modified somewhat uh, from from Chuck Kraft's original. This one that's on the screen now is the first one I'm going to tie. This is a standard Creolex with some modifications that both uh, Chris and I have made to the pattern. Um, if it it differs slightly from uh, from Chuck's original, uh, and then I'm going to go into uh, one that has a stinger hook in it, and I'll show you that real quick. And uh, for those of you. You can go back to the video and now you you can go back and look at all the materials lists because those are all will be saved with the video right so that's the reason I did this is you don't have to write all that uh, the materials down they're up on the screen but but TC I think we can go in uh, with tie these flies in Is that cool. All right, so. The first fly is the standard Creolex in quotes. Uh, Chuck Kraft did not tie the fly exactly like this, but he tied it darn close. I had a chance to uh, meet Chuck a couple times. Uh, it, he passed away uh, just after the last Edison show in 2020. And some, he, he got sick at the Edison show. Uh, he had some issues with uh, respiratory problems. And it ended up he passed away. People believe it was, uh, he had contracted an early case of COVID. All right. So I'm going to tie this in a size four standard length standard wire hook. My favorite hook is Gatsu B10S. It is super duper sharp. It is not cheap, but I tie most of my smallmouth flies on, on, this, fly, on this hook. The, again, this is size four. And what I'm going to do is start with, uh, with red thread. This is three aught. This is a flat wax nylon thread. So it's a heavy thread. Um, and I'm going to put in a lead eye. In this case, it's a 130th of an ounce lead eye. And I'm going to fix that to the top of the shank, which will invert the fly when you fish it. So it'll, it'll, it'll flip the fly when we fish it. What I did to, to affix the, um, the lead eye is we're doing cross wraps, go one way, two or three the other, and then I'm gonna wrap around and I'm gonna tighten those thread wraps to lock this to keep that lead eye from rocking back and forth. We're about a third of the way back on the hook shank. I can't see, but does that look good? Yep. Okay, uh, it looked good in practice and what I'm going to do is, is, is drop some super glue on both sides of that and kind of saturate that area with super glue just to keep, keep that, that lead eye from, from spinning. This is true for all your clousers, any, any, any fly with a lead eye, you want to uh, come in and, and affix that. Oh, by the way, I paint my own lead eyes. This is painted red, and I've got a, uh, a, a pupil that includes a silver and a black eye. You don't have to do that with this fly. If you use any kind of dumbbell eye, it's fine. Um, I think that Chuck uh, use, uses a plated eye, but I, I, I like these kind of eyes. Now the material for this uh, fly is, is called Krennic. And this is made uh, by a company that originally started selling uh, flash materials to the needle industry, needle pointers. 
Um, it's out of Parkersburg, West Virginia. And so this clinic, this, uh, you can find it in uh, some fly shops, it's very similar to Polar Flash. I use Krennic because that this is the original, it's gold. Uh, and that's what we're gonna use for the belly of the fly. Uh, you will see this very quick pattern to tie. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab a bunch of, of Krennic Cut that off. You see that's a pretty healthy dose. Okay, I'm gonna make this fly about this long. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bind that down and work my thread back towards the back of the fly. You can this is a guide fly. When you tie this, this fly, it moves along really fast. You can tie a bunch of these in a hurry. Okay, so what I've done is basically wrap that critic down to, to where the tail would be and right in front of those lead, eye, lead eyes. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pull the critic forward and make a couple wraps in front of the lead eye and we're gonna come back behind and bind it down, okay? Now I haven't let go of the crinic yet. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna taper cut that back like that. No lose you yet. Pretty straightforward fly. This is a great turn. Great trout pattern. And we're gonna be talking in the talk about reaction flies and this, this and reaction strikes. And this is a great reaction fly, triggering fly. Okay, I'm gonna use the same material in a copper color. So this is copper and I, I put the numbers in, in the presentation. If you're here and you want them, it's 0211HL. And the, the, the gold was 002HL. Those are the material codes. I'm gonna just take a little bit of this. You can see this, this material is, is really flexible. It's not stiff like other flash, which allows it to move in the water. Okay. Now what we're gonna to do to, to tie this, this front part down, we're just gonna put it around the thread, bind that down. Come back behind the eye, bind that down. And again, taper cut it. I got a little more healthy uh, amount of flash on there than I would typically do it. Just taper cut that a little bit. Okay, and now all we're gonna do is whip finish this fly. Again, this is a guide fly. Um, the whole concept of guide fly is that these, these are patterns that can be tied quickly by guides overnight to get them ready for the next day on the water. Now we're gonna come in with, uh, this is uh, bone dry. It's a UV curing uh, cement. Just gonna uh, coat the, the thread area. We're gonna come in there with the light and cure that. All right, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna even these out a little bit because I couldn't see, but that makes the top and bottom flare about the same. There's, there's your uh, standard Creolex. 
This color combination is lethal. Uh, I tie this fly in a lot of other colors, but this color just seems to always produce. Okay, so I'm going to put the standard Creolex down. And now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to show you um, Chris Walker's, I'll call it secret. Uh, it's an adaptation of of this fly for a trailer hook. Let me show you the, the version with the trailer hook. I, uh, I tied one earlier. Okay. So this fly has a stinger hook in the back uh, used for uh, swinging flies. Um, this is a great steelhead uh, pattern, great trout swinging pattern, your trout spay. And one of the difference, yep. One of the differences um, or why you want a trailer hook is, is a smallmouth is a predator that attacks the head. So the, the original design is perfect for smallmouth because they, they'll attack the eye. Trout, however, are often attacked from the tail. And so we, we prefer a stinger hook because that's where the, where the point of attack is occurring, okay? Um, and I just wanna share that uh, I'm, I'm learning spay fishing or spay casting and swinging. And uh, it was three weeks ago, I caught my first significant steelhead adult on, on a swung fly, and this is the fly I caught in on. All right, so this is a stinger hook version. So uh, we're gonna start with a long shank. In my case, I'm using uh, a size eight. I think this is a eight X long. It doesn't really matter because I'm just using it for the shank. So, um, those of you who are familiar with uh, these stinger style hooks, this is a familiar theme. Is we're just going to use the front part for the shank, and then the 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 stinger hook is going to get extended. Uh, sometimes people use wire. Sometimes people use uh, gel spun. Uh, in my case, I'm going to use wire. And what we're going to do to fix that. Uh, to the hook is I'm going to thread it down through the eye. Okay, so so let me back up just a little bit. In my case, I'm using uh, beetle on wire, which is a nylon coated uh, stainless steel wire. This is pretty inex. No, it's not cheap, but you can get this at Hobby Lobby. This beetle on. Uh, this is 18 thousandths uh, beetle on, uh, which is a, it's about 26 pound uh, test, which is fine for most of uh, our trout fishing. Um, I'm going to set the length of that, that stinger hook to be right there. And I use a reference, my material clip on that hook. Uh, I think that it, it measures out about an inch and a half. It's a two and a half inch long fly. And you can see that I just wrapped down that wire. Um, but you, what you can't see is, is that I, I twisted it. So you wanna uh, try to not twist when you wrap it down. So let me correct that. <clears throat> Okay, and I bound that down pretty good. I'm going to put a little bit of super glue in. And now I'm going to pull back that wire. You want to be really aware of keeping your hook eye open so that you can, you have enough room to uh, tie this on on, on the stream. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna cut off that excess wire. 
Did I lose anybody yet? Okay. So next we're going to uh, get our, our lead eye. <clears throat> I'm going to use the same 1 30th of an ounce uh, lead eye. You can make these uh, smaller or heavier. Uh, oftentimes, um, <clears throat> if, if you're not familiar with the with the swinging style, uh, we use sink tip lines so we can manipulate the sink rate of the fly with the line itself. Uh, that's something that you can do in standard streamer fishing as well, but it's a lot more common in, in spay world. Uh, so <clears throat> you don't want to overweight the fly or it becomes uh, a little dangerous to cast. All right. So same, same way to attach that, that uh, lead eye on, we're, we wanna put it on the belly, okay? So away from the stinger. And then we're gonna uh, drop, put a drop of super glue on both sides there to keep it from spinning around. Okay, lose anybody. Good to go, all right. Same deal with the uh, Krennic. We're just gonna get a little bit of the, uh, the a, a decent hunk, call it decent hunk. And in this case, let's set that length of that tail right there. We're gonna wrap this down just like we did with the standard fly. You can see that this, this fly is, takes a little longer than the standard Creel X, but it, but it moves along pretty fast, which is really helpful. Who wants to spend a lot of time tying a fly that may end up under a rock? Okay. So, so to decode what I just did is I tied it forward of the, uh, the, the eye and then came back just like I did with the standard Creel X. You can see I'm getting ready for the taper cut right here. Cool. All right. Now. I'm gonna flip just like it did with the standard Creel X. <clears throat> and we're gonna put the copper in. Now, there's a couple different ways we could we can tie this fly. I can tie this wing so that it 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 looks just like this. So we just have the, the wing color on the, on the top, or I can, I can have a blended color. So I have a dark and, and, and a light tail. Um, I didn't think about it, but let me just uh, go back. So if you forgot, you can just go back. What I'm doing is I'm putting that, what will be the top color, I'm wrapping that all the way back to the tail. The reason we do this is because those long fibers will tend to foul when we fish the fly. So <clears throat> they'll wrap around the hook. This kind of minimizes the chance that they'll do that. Now I'm gonna come forward. Okay, now I'm gonna flip it. All right. <clears throat> All 
Ta da. All right. Now, we're going to do just like we did with the other. It's a lot better if you don't leave go of that, baby. Go. Cool. Now, whoosh, always happens. We're going to just build a head. And you can see I'm just doing this with the whip finish. Put some UV on there. Again, I'm using the bone dry. We we'll go ahead and cure that. Now, this is the part that's easy to forget. Now you've got two hook uh, points in there. Uh, a, a lot of our steelhead uh, streams, you can only use one point. Uh, this, this fly is designed so you've got the stinger where it matters. So uh, you wanna remember to cut that hook. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna get in there and cut it off leaving that in the vise, otherwise it'll fly all around. And now we'll just taper, taper cut the tail, which will allow it to swim a little bit better. Um, oh, got it, thanks. All right, I'm gonna take that piece out. Does that help if I, Put it in there. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. You get the idea? So two ways to tie uh, the same pattern. Uh, in, in this case, we've adjusted the fly design based on the triggering uh, style of the fish that we're, we're fishing for. I just wanted to share with you these kind of techniques because uh, we generally don't haven't seen them here at the at this meeting. Um, and and if uh, for those of you who are big steelhead swingers, uh, this is not an earth shattering uh, modification. For those of us who uh, might be more uh, trout folks and uh, the smallmouth folks, that's uh, that's kind of a newer way to to do a familiar fly. Yeah, go ahead, Dick. Sure, I can, uh, what I'll do is, uh, well, I can, oh, that's the, uh, let me, let me just put the ones I just tied on this. This is the, that's the stinger. And this is, the standard. Cool. So Kirk, are there other color variations that you like or is it that's your go-to and you almost always got that one on? Um, for, I always have this, this on. If I'm fishing a Creel X, you can almost bet money that it's this color. Uh, but I, I have fished a uh, pearl and I, I carry those with me. In, in both Stinger and uh, Standard, uh, I fished in all bronze. Actually, I hooked a really nice carp uh, on the all bronze, which I believe they eat for a, for a crayfish. Mm -hmm. well, any uh, variation in the thread color? You like the red all the time? Uh, uh, I, I, I like the red. I, I like uh, putting a little red in a fly. Um, I, I think it it helps, but uh, you know you're welcome to use whatever color you you prefer. I got another question for you. I tied this. I think John Lively did it once. Now I tied it with flashable, but I don't think it's as thin and as flexible as this. Yeah, I. Um, I don't think it's that the movement of the water. I 
So, so I, I would uh, say I, I've tied these and I've seen other flash fly patterns. They're tied in different with, with flashaboo and other flash materials. Um, I have a lot of confidence in this Krennic. It, it is different in a couple different ways. Uh, first, you're right, it's flexible. When this gets in the water, it really swims. I didn't do that. Yeah, it really swims and it doesn't bunch together. The other thing that's that um, in those codes that I gave you, the HL, there is actually embedded in this material is there's some so other fibers that they, they, they blend in. And, and those, those are important to keeping it from bunching up. Cause this is, if you will look at this material close, you'll see it's twisted, okay? So what they would normally do with this flash is they would turn this into uh, piping that needle pointers and crafters would use uh, for embroidering and, and different kind of needle pointing. And, and they would further process this flash in, into a braid, okay, or piping, different products like that to embellish uh, Fabrics and can you get that penny in fabric stores like Joanne's or no. no. You you can you could maybe get the braid there, this this credit company, but you would find this this flash material um, is in a few fly shops. The one online fly shop that I, I know you can get it at is Dakota Anglers out of uh, South Dakota. And I I, I buy some of from them and, and they carry this in, in small and bulk versions. You can get it from Mossy Creek uh, down in Harrisonburg, Virginia, which is near where Chuck Craft lived. Um, and, and more companies are beginning to, to, to carry this. You can find this a lot in the West. For some reason, this is getting more popular in the West. It's probably because Chris is talking up the fly. <laughs> Cool. Cool. All right. You gonna? You're ready to take over? Yeah. Do you want this mic or do you? Uh, okay. Good. You're not. You're done tied, correct? I'm done tied. Do you want that light to go away? And then where did I put the clicker? Yeah, you have the clicker. Yeah, I got the clicker. Can folks hear me okay? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna get um get going with some club announcements now. Uh, before we turn it back over to Kirk. Um, I'm uh, TC, I'm the TC Owens. I'm the uh, vice president at uh, uh, Twin Tiers Five Rivers chapter. Um, just wanna talk a little bit about um, what we've got going on as a club. Um, we are, uh, um, we're doing everything that we can to keep uh, the club going throughout COVID and all its ups and downs and twists and turns. Um, part of that is uh, what you see here tonight, our work to do hybrid programming uh, so we can be in person or virtual. Um, this um, um, and all the meetings this, this season uh, through the spring will be happening uh, in this hybrid presentation mode. Um, the, may, the best way to stay in touch with everything that's coming up, and there's a lot coming up, apart from the monthly meetings, uh, is to uh, sign up on our MailChimp. You can do that through our website. Uh, also, uh, if you're not following us on Facebook, be sure to follow us on Facebook. Um, so our hybrid meetings are um, 
in person and virtual. Um, participate in the way that feels most comfortable to you given the uh, public health climate at the time. Uh, if you wish to connect virtually, you can do so via Zoom. It's the same link throughout the entire program season. Uh, and those links are found in the event pages on Facebook. Uh, they also come through our uh, monthly emails and um, program meeting, uh, you know, update emails. Uh, our speakers throughout the coming season will be uh, mostly in person at this point, although I think there may be some, some folks virtually. Um, if COVID goes crazy or we've got some serious weather, uh, especially throughout the winter, uh, we will be able to meet, uh, we will be able to host a meeting and you know uh, have presentations regardless, right? So part of what we've been talking about is really how do we make our meeting schedules, uh, you know, COVID, COVID proof. Um, and any sort of changes in whether or not the meeting's happening here at the Legion Hall in South Corning uh, in, in Barrett Hall uh, will be communicated via email and Facebook. And also I just want to, um, uh, give a shout out really quick to uh, board member Dick Naylor, who has made this space available to us, this really wonderful space with a great hall where we can all spread out and, uh, and grab a beer at the bar. Um, so come on down if you're online. Uh, there's plenty of room here. Um, anybody that uh, comes will be asked to sign a hold harmless agreement. Um, you need to be fully vaccinated to attend in person. If you're uh, not fully vaccinated, obviously you can still connect via Zoom or through Facebook. Uh, you should have no COVID symptoms if you're coming in person and uh, masks are required indoors unless uh, you're, you're drinking one of those beers you got at the, at the bar. Um, and tip your bartenders generously. Um, youth attendees require a uh, full vaccination and uh, which must be signed by a parent. Uh, we're gonna be updating this policy on a monthly basis as the county and CDC and Fly Fishers International uh, continues to adjust as well. Um, connect any way you want in person, Facebook live or zoom. And really in this, uh, you know, this time where it, sometimes it feels weird to get out or you don't know, um, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to build community right now, one way or the other, um, you know, feel free to, um, you know, chat with people sidebar on zoom uh in the in the chat box if you want come on down schedule some fishing trips with folks um yeah um share your questions and comments um through the chats and facebook and zoom and oh and also you can use our Facebook page and our group. So there are two ways on Facebook that you can connect with us. Uh, there's the, the page, which is the more uh, institutional voice of the club, uh, but there's the group, which is for members and non-members. And that's a great way for you to, uh, you know, share a picture of that great landlock you just caught or, um, you know, share conditions or other local information. This thing has a card full. Oh, uh, can you just hit, uh, it should be, hang on a second. Oh, card still full. Sure. All right.
You want to, you, uh, want to switch to a different camera or we we'll just go uh, cardinal? No, we can just, uh, why don't you just do voice? If you want to just do voice only. Just sure, <laughs> sure. I'll just, we'll just keep going. Yeah. We're, we're working through this. <laughs> okay, so um, I think uh, TC covered this, uh, but uh, the club announcements are on the page. Discussion on the group. And so if you're not a part of the two Facebook entities, you're missing half. Um, and you'll have to figure out which half you're missing. Um, let's see. I think I'm going the wrong way. Okay, this is the best part anyway. Um, I'm really excited about the stuff we've got planned. Is uh, the, the program meetings that we've got uh, set up uh, in January, our very own Jim Walk will be right here. And uh, Jim is gonna be uh, talking about the missing link. It's a really, really interesting uh, fly that was developed by Mike Mercer of the Fly Shop in Redding, California. Um, and if you have not fished the missing link, it is an amazing dry fly and you're not gonna wanna miss that meeting. That's gonna be January um, and it's January 10th because we're offset because of the, the holiday, the New Year's holiday, but it'll be right here and we're gonna be hybrid and uh, in February, uh, we will have our first woman angler speaker. Um, and this is Lindsay Agnes. Lindsay is from Rochester. Uh, she leads the Trout Unlimited Women Connects, uh, women's uh, group statewide. But the reason you want to come is not because Lindsay is really active in women and getting women involved in fly fishing. You wanna come because Lindsay is a badass spay caster. She is a really super knowledgeable uh, spay caster. She taught me how to spay cast. Uh, she fishes with her husband, Dave, and uh, they'll be coming down here to present in February. Um, it will be a steelheading presentation with some spay mingled in. We got a lot of good stuff uh, coming. Uh, do you want to take it back? Okay. So the next uh, the next thing that we've got coming up is uh, beginning in January. A uh, one of our other board members, Matt Collins, has been organizing a master fly tying series. Um, it'll be kicking off with uh, our own uh, Kirk Klingensmith uh, that will be uh, doing a master class on smallmouth fishing, correct? Um, then we'll have Michael Linetsky and maybe Josh Filter with him talking about, I believe, uh, finger fishing in the, fishing the Finger Lakes tribs and the, the Ithaca, uh, you know, particularly around Ithaca. Um, and then um, I think March is yet to be confirmed, but uh, we will let you know as soon as we have that confirmed. Um, also beginning um, in January, uh, we will be doing our, for the second time, a um, beginning fly tying class. Uh, this will be four sessions bi-weekly uh, in January and February. And uh, Bill Wirtz has been coordinating that. Um, both the master fly tying and the beginner fly tying sessions are, will be all virtual. Um, and are uh, open to, uh, FFI members. Um, the go. Yeah, we have three folks signed up for uh, for that so far. The beginners. Oh, 
Yeah. So don't wait too long. Yeah. Don't snooze on it. It's a, it's the type of situation where I think it's, is it capped at eight? Yeah. It's capped at eight. So capped at eight. And, um, are the, the materials are provided, right? Or yeah. There's, they, they put uh, there's a small material fee to, to cover the materials and you get enough, uh, to, there's be fly, five flies tied and you get enough for five each. And we ship the materials to you. So uh, before the class starts, uh, and I think last year it cost 25 bucks. So it's yeah, not a big a, deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, next up, we've got um, fundraising and auction coming up. Uh, Bob Walker has been going through um, our library and looking at the great selection of books and DVDs that we have. Um, so that will be beginning in January, uh, similar in a similar rollout to last year using the website uh, 32 auctions. Um, so bid bid generously. It helps the club. It helps us, uh, you know, spend, you know, have have resources to, you know, do this type of hybrid programming that we're doing. It helps us offset the cost of beginner fly tying classes. It helps us pay for these great speakers that we do in collaboration with uh, other, other fishing and uh, fly tying clubs. Um, also, um, our Women Connects work continues being held down by uh, Pam Walker, and there will be a lot more coming in uh, 2022, um, a fishing outing for uh, women and other events. So stay tuned for that. Um, are there any other announcements that uh, we're forgetting that folks want to? We're planning for the, the school uh, that's underway. Uh, we're going to do that outside this year. Oh, that's right. So uh, we realized that it's virtually impossible to uh, hold the school in a public school with some kind of confidence that we can do it. So we're going to target to do it uh, in a venue which is more COVID proof, uh, which means we're going to shift the school to a smaller group on the water with the thought that you're going to leave catching a fish. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. So different, different approach. And uh, Bob, do you want to say anything about fundraisers? Okay, so we're going to start selling library to uh, materials to club members, uh, and you'll get more information on that. Look in your email. Cool. So we're going to kick it over to uh, Bob Carlson right now to uh, reintroduce our, <laughs> our esteemed speaker for the evening. Carlson, what do you got, man? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, cool. So it's my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Kirk Klingensmith as our speaker. Kirk, as I think everybody knows, is our club president, and uh, he has been club president since 2008 and recently signed up for another 10-year contract. Um, he is the guy that uh, drives this club to do so much in the way of teaching fly fishing and fly tying and pushing the group just to do more and more in those, uh, those categories. He has contributed to three fly fishing books and he's uh, presented to numerous TU and FFI fly fishing clubs and chapters. Uh, he's been fishing for 52 years in both fresh and salt water. And I know he is on the water fishing all the time. This guy is always fishing. Uh, he's a very accomplished fly fisherman and a very innovative fly tire, as you guys can see. Uh, and tonight, Kirk is gonna be talking about what triggers a fish into striking and eating our flies. I know he fishes for numerous species using lots of different techniques in both fresh and salt water. And I know he also has lots of interesting ideas and he's always on top of other people's ideas and he's trying lots of different things. So I hope everybody else is looking forward to this, this, this talk as much as I am. With well, that, I'll turn it over to Kirk. Well, that was humbling. Humbling. Hey, TC, how many people do we have on Zoom these right now? Uh, looks like we've got 11 on Zoom. We've got 
10 on Facebook? Yeah, so, so just so you know, this is, let me get our community together because we have one, two, three, eight, eight folks here. We have 10 folks on Facebook. We have 10 folks on Zoom. And probably some of those intermittent. So, so let's call 25. So just so you know, it, it's kind of a pretty decent turnout for, for a club meeting, but it just happens to be we're in a variety of different places. So uh, thank you. Um, by the way, before I leave the picture, that's uh, a seven and a half pound uh, large mouse from Bill Wirtz's leg that I caught with him rowing me. Okay. So uh, what I want to what I want to talk about tonight is have us kind of think about why it is that fish put our fly in their mouth. And that's what we're gonna think about. And and in a certain way, it could be really easy. We, we'd say, well, we think it's to eat it. But I hope as I go through this presentation, you're going to see there's lots and lots of reasons that they will put the fly in the mouth or not that we can think more deeply about to become a better fly fisher. So first of all, let's kind of focus in on, on what are they looking for? So this is a video shot by Barry and Kathy Beck in New Zealand of a trout surveying a flow. This is not an unfamiliar sight as we consider this fish is in a food conveyor, okay? There's all kinds of stuff going down. And what you can see is this fish is surveying the conveyor, looking for food, yes? He sees a lot of junk in the water, but what is it that he's looking for that says that item is food? Okay. So let me introduce a principle. It comes from our psychology friends called selective attention. Okay, I'm not gonna read that, you can read it, but, but I'll read parts of it. A selective at attention is, is the mental process we all go through where we focus on certain things and discard others, okay? We do this all the time. Selective intention focuses on relevant signals to manage all the noise that goes in on our life. We do this, but the, this business of enhancing relevant signals are what we all use when we, when we find things that we like or things that bring danger, okay? And those signals we're gonna to refer to as triggers. So selective attention is, is how fish look for food. And it, if you were to show a fly to a three-year-old, one of the questions you always get is that hook is hanging off its butt. Doesn't the fish see that? Why would it? take something with a hook off his butt. And we don't think about that because we're not three years old anymore, but it's a really important question is that fish doesn't notice the hook because he's looking for other things that indicate food. This is the trigger. This is a selection, selective intention. This is what we need want to think about, about what does the fish see that enhances his, his, his uh, 
senses that that's food. Okay. So now remind you that in, in a stream that a fish notices that everything goes with the flow. Okay. So everything that the food, the leaves, the cigarette butts, they all follow the pattern of the flow. So one of the things that is a, is, is a part of the trout's equation is that the flow or, or the food comes in a pattern, right? So if we deliver our fly and it doesn't go with the flow, that trout or that fish isn't like super duper smart. He just goes, ah, oh, shit, that's not food, right? Because the, the food goes with the flow. Okay, except as we could quickly uh, point out that certain types of food, like the, 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 the bait fish, it doesn't go with the flow. So these begin to set a context, if you will, of what indicates food. Now, this is a video of a swimming mayfly, a nymph that is, swims to the surface and is going to hatch. This is on a loop, so it was a pretty cool video, so we could watch it for a little bit. And you can see that the dun emerges out of that nymphal shot, okay? This is a second view of, of a hatching bug. In that case, he's already been to the surface and you can see the dun crawling out of the nymphal shuck. Okay, here we go. We're gonna, this is gonna loop again, but notice the things that are going on that could potentially indicate food, okay? First of all, question for you. When is this bug most vulnerable? In the film, as it's crawling through that film. That film is like a meniscus. It's, a, it's really hard to get through. That bug has to crawl through. Fish learn that. What do you also see as, as that, that mayfly comes out of the nymphal shuck. Check it out. You see flash, you see movement without forward movement. So the bug, if, can I call it, it, it moves, it twitches, yes? But it doesn't like shh, move. It's going with the flow. It's twitching though, it's, it's getting out. It elongates, the nymphal shuck uh, hangs there for a while. As the nymph goes up, you see it swims. All these we could think about could be indicators for our friend of fish and what it is that they're looking for that triggers food. But from my experience, that emergence on the surface when they're crawling out of the shuck is the most vulnerable time and trout learn that and begin to key on it. Okay, so uh, often in, in, in our fly designs, we'll refer to flies as naturals or attractors. And, and honestly, with the proliferation of fly designs, this, there's, there's a spectrum, okay? And, and natural flies are, are intended to imitate what the fish is eating, but, but they often emphasize a trigger or maybe several triggers that the fly designer believes that that fish is looking for, right? Attractors, some of the attractor flies, they tend to look like generic food items, but they amplify a trigger. For example, this, this, this lightning bug nymph imitates that flash. Some attractors don't look anything like a bug, uh, but they're 
more to trigger the curiosity. And we're going to talk about that just in a moment. Now, we could probably have a two hour talk, maybe a lot longer about fish optics. But I want to just emphasize a few points and get us to consider that what the fish sees and what we're used to seeing are different. And it's really helpful if we think about that in our fishing. First of all, we've, we've heard or we read a lot about this so-called cone of vision. So a, a fish can see out of the water's surface in a, like a cone type pattern. And that window gets smaller the closer the fish is to the surface. We've read a lot about that. Um, one thing that we don't think a lot about, but is, is, is true, is that the surface is, is a mirror below it. So the, the same optics that create the cone pattern, which we, we need to be mindful of when we're sneaking up on fish, is also re reflects light below it outside of the cone. And so there's a mirror out there. And what that mirror does is it tends to amplify things like a, a bug's legs, a dimpled pattern. Uh, so that the, the struggling on the surface can create a flash storm. It looks like lightning to the fish or a skittering caddis looks similar. But remember when your fly line drops on that surface, it looks just the same. It's an explosion of light, right? So we need to be mindful of that. And, and underneath and uh, clear, we, we need to, to be mindful that the fish can see a lot further than we can see. The whole point of this slide is to get us to consider that what the fish sees and what we see are different. And we need to translate that in our fishing. Um, and, and, and so enough said, okay. So why else do fish put things in their mouths? We've talked about eating it because they can see it, right? Well, let me remind you of, of, again, let me take you back to the third grader, is fish don't have hands. And, and okay, I'm not trying to be smart here, is, is fish are naturally designed when they see something to interrogate it next, they can't pick it up like we do, you know, like we learn to as a baby, touch it, you know. But babies do this, they put it in their mouth, right? What are they looking for? They're feeling it, they're tasting it, they're kind of interrogating it. Well, that's exactly what natural fish do, is, is they suck things in their mouth all the time so they can assess them further. They're asking, is this food? What the hell is this? They put it in their mouth, right? And what the hell is this? And what are they doing? That they're gonna taste it, they're gonna feel it. If, it. if it feels and tastes like food, boom, food, okay? If, if not, they spit it out. And some kinds of fish, like a smallmouth bass can spit it out in a nanosecond. Trout tend to not spit it out as quickly. And they also have, teeth on the roof of their mouth and they tend to get trouble getting it out, okay? But one of the considerations we've got here is did your fly feel like food? Huh, never thought of that before. And in fast water, or if they can't see it visually, they're often grabbing it with their mouth. And, and when things are zooming by, that's the only option they have that's is gonna, if, does that look like food? I don't know. Put it in your mouth and see. Boom. Okay. So it isn't like they, they're, they're absolutely sure they're going to eat it. They just want to figure out if it's food. Make sense? Okay. So you might want to consider the mop fly. The mop fly has become incredibly popular. It's a stupid, simple pattern to tie. And it's crazy effective. And, and uh, one of the things that we need to be mindful of is when that fish puts that thing in their mouth, it first of all, it, 
it wiggles in the water very easily. So there's movement without, mo there, there's the twitching thing going on, but it also feels different. Could it be the mop fly feels like poop? Now let's turn it to other reasons that, that fish put stuff in their mouth. And one of them is instinct. And it, as a way of an example for trout and salmon, let's think about an egg. A lot of people don't know this, but trout and salmon instinctually, if they see an egg, they grab it. If, if it's their egg, they put it back in their nest. If it's not their egg, they crush it and spit it out. Well, how, why did the Lord do it that way? I don't know, but I'm telling you, he did. So when we fish, when we fish for steelhead, salmon, trout with egg patterns, we're not necessarily trying to trigger that salmon to eat that egg because the salmon, Pacific salmon, are they, they don't eat when they're uh, on their way to spawn. But what they are programmed to do is crush that egg. So they put it in their mouth, crush it, we got them. Okay. Another example where instincts we can trigger are. Uh, this came true for me when I was fishing in a pond at Ray Grander's property. Those of us uh, been around for a while, Ray Grander was one of the founding members of our club. He, he had a fly shop out in Pine Valley, several ponds. And I was lucky enough to get invited. And he had a pond stocked with smallmouth bass, bunch of smallmouth bass in there. And it was real clear. And you'd hook a smallmouth bass, a little one. If you hooked a little one, the big ones would attack it like boom. They'd attack it right away. And I go, what the what? So it's interesting that something in the fish's programming is when they see they'll they'll be coexisting in a happy world until that their buddy starts looking sick or acting weird okay and there's something in their programming that they kill the sick they kill the the ones that are acting up okay so we can use this instinct to trigger the fish to attack our fly so think about this, is in a streamer, which imitates a minnow, you don't want it to swim good. You want it to swim like it's got COVID, okay? You want it to look bad, to look like it's in trouble to trigger this instinct. Now, another instinct that we can trigger is the territorialism and brown trout are a great example of this is a little trout that gets in a brown trout space is in for trouble okay because they're going to chase that little pest out of their space they might nip or grab it if they think it's not getting the message okay and and they're not necessarily trying to eat it they're just trying to get it the hell away okay and so that is one of the reasons that we use uh the the stinger hook the trailer hook on the back as it's shown there well, you can't see it in this is is a trailer hook because that 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 brown trout will often just nip at that that fly to get it get it the hell away Okay, now this is true not only for brown trout, but we can see this in the case of like smallmouth. In the case of, well, let me take the case of nesting. So you know with smallmouth, it's the, the male that protects the nest. 
and they will chase anything away from the nest that comes near. And it doesn't, and they're not chasing it away because they want to eat it. They're chasing it away because they want it the hell away from the nest. And, and, uh, and with the pressure that, what do we mean with pressure? With, with fishing, if they're fished over a lot, they won't be so aggressive, but they will take a fly or a lure that, that ends up in their nest. They'll pick it up and they'll take it outside of their nest and drop it. Okay. And the same is true for all the, the cichlids, the, 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 the bluegills, the, the bass. They, will, they have the same behavior. Again, these are kind of things to think about. Why does a fish put, put our, our fly in its mouth? Now, we've been talking so far about things they see, right? They see the flash and the bug. They see the... Okay, the net. but there's, 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 let's expand a little bit. It's, it's all fish have, have a, a lateral line and, and the lateral line acts like a radar. This is unfamiliar. A lot of these things like the visual cues are unfamiliar because we're not used to being underwater and seeing all those reflections and cones of vision and stuff. But we're, we're really not, we don't have nothing like a lateral line, right? So the fish can actually feel pressure and vibration. This is how they find food. They don't starve when the, the, the water gets chocolate milk. They don't starve at night. As a matter of fact, brown trout hunt at night. They're not hunting by vision necessarily. Their lateral line becomes their radar and what they can feel is the push so they know when something's near them they know how big it is and where it is from this lateral line they can feel the troubled bait fish that that the example from ray grander's pond they that vibration feel sends an instinct to them okay that we we don't connect to because we don't have nothing like that Okay, so in our, our spin fishing uh, buddies, they, they use this lateral line triggering and a lot of baits that they fish with. And, and our musky fishing friends know that, that if there's a struggling bait fish, a musky can feel it from hundreds. I've seen maybe thousands of yards away. Okay, that's how good these lateral lines work. So um, in, in, in our fly world, we, there's, there's a couple different ways that we can excite the, uh, the lateral line. One is by flies that are designed to push water. So poppers are a good example. The, the, the Kelly Gallup's dungeon pattern, which, which has a big profile, is an example of a whole class of flies, streamer flies, that have big profiles to push water. A stealth bomber is another example of, uh, of, of a bass pattern that pushes a lot of water. Other flies designed to, in, to, to, to create these vibrations, like the rattle flies, game changers, wiggle lips, and so forth. Okay, really important to think about lateral line triggers. Okay, now it's really important also to understand fish can hear boatloads better than we can. Boatloads better than we can, it's three times. So, so if you've ever been in a swimming pool and somebody's like clunked the side of the swimming pool with a rock, it's like deafening. Okay, and, and so we need to be mindful of that because we need to translate our hearing to how the fish hears. Because often it's that sound that triggers the fish to know it's food time, right? So plopping sound, like when a cicada drops off, a big damn bug drops onto the surface, 
uh, beetles, black, uh, grasshoppers, those kind of things, or the splash of a bait fish. Or, or did you know when a crayfish triggers it, a swimming and makes a clicking sound? That's why we put rattles in, in, in a lot of uh, crayfish patterns. That might be why jigs work so well when that jig head clunks on rocks, okay? It's making a sound that's familiar and triggers, holy shit, there's a crayfish, okay? Other, other, other sounds familiar, chugging, popping, that kind of thing, okay, important. So audible triggers, we talked about these, uh, the plop into the water. Uh, in smallmouth, in my fishing, as you're fishing along, I can watch a, 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 a smallmouth trigger. They'll almost go 10 feet. That fly drops down. The fish is over there like lightning on it when it, when it hears that plop, okay? Um, now, I'll just mention uh, before we leave this is uh, Blaine Chocolate talks a lot about this, is this business of multiple triggers. So sometimes the fish will, will crush the fly on, the, on, on that trigger. The plop, it, a baseball could have landed on the water and the fish is going to nail it, okay? Um, and the, these we... we we refer to as reaction strikes, you know? And, and so the pattern that I showed you, the Creel X fly triggers the flash reaction. They see that flash, boom, they hear the plop, boom. Smallmouth, when, when, they're, when they're at the peak of their metabolism, they're up in reaction. And so, but, but most often it's my experience that fish go on multiple triggers. There's certain things that get their attention, okay? And other things that seal the deal. We're gonna talk lots and lots more about this. We're gonna expand on this. Um, and, and so an example might be they're attracted by a flash, a profile, but they'll eat when they're kind of see, maybe they, they're looking, whatever it is they're looking for. There's multiple triggers, the shape, the action, the twitching, those kind of things. Okay. Any questions so far? We call cool online? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let me let me shift gears. Important to shift gears here because the same things that fish use to sense food are the same senses they have that sense danger, okay? And let's, let's just say fish do not like to be eaten, okay? Okay? And the, that if you see a bigger fish, he hasn't been eaten. So I would surmise that the reason he's been eaten because he's been successful at avoiding predators. Really important calculus in fish world, okay? So let's think about the visual sound and lateral line cues that, that cause that fish to think, holy shit, not food, that's, that's, that's danger, that's a predator, okay? And realize that those sensitivities to those triggers amplify the clearer the water, the stiller the water, the more light and the more predators that, that are around. Yes? Maybe you wanna, can you, somebody close that door? Cool. So let's talk about this is, is, yeah, they see you coming. That's how they, and one of the ways that fish can tell that danger is coming is they see it, okay? So there's ways that we can be mindful of this in our fishing. And we talked about the cone of vision before. I'm not gonna go into detail, maybe I should have. 
Um, but that cone of vision is something to learn about if you're not familiar. Uh, underwater motion is generally not as threatening as the motion above the water. Predators tend to come from up. Some predators down there, water snakes primarily, eagles, mergansers live up there. Okay. So, um, and, and so predators tend to disturb the surface. If you disturb the surface, they don't necessarily think of you as, holy shit, there's, there's, there's Dick Naylor coming with his fly rod. They're thinking, holy shit, something bad. Yeah, or walking stick. So, so we need to be careful uh, and mindful of, of how we might be triggering these danger signs, okay? I can't tell you how important stealth is. And, and uh, I, I see it a lot is people, I watch the water, people come in, they walk in, there's fish is gone and they'll, they'll fish there for an hour all day, no fish. But they, they blew it walking in. That, that fish is gone pronto and, and they didn't even know it. Now they can still, they hear you coming. And so um, it's way more important than most people think about. And, and splashing from wading from your boots, jumping on the boat. Um, and, and of course, the more pressure and the more predators these fish see, the more they're in tune to avoiding it. They can feel you. So, we, we go into a, a slow pool, slow water. We start wading in there like we normally do. It pushes a pressure wave. You can just watch, if you're familiar, watch the fish and you'll see their demeanor change as soon as they feel you. And, and boat hauls will push the water just the same way. So we need to be really careful about that and fish ahead of the boat. All right. So let's talk a little bit more about that fish learn, all right? They don't like being caught. So they tend to avoid flies and tactics that have caught them before. They, as they're pressured more, as they've been caught more, they tend to suck in less stuff to investigate it because they, they've learned that's not good. They tend to be a lot more selective on what indicates food to them. And they tend to be a lot less aggressive with those instincts that we talked about. So, um, and they tend not to move as far. They tend to be more cautious. However, they still need to eat. They still do eat. And they will trigger with a well-placed fly. So how should this affect us? Is, so uh, there's bumper stickers and shirts available. It's not the fly, stupid. Uh, there's, there's some more bold ways that those shirts are made these days. But it really, it really uh, is stunning when, when we, when we're fishing, somebody says I caught one, we say, what'd you get them on, right? It's, it's almost like a social thing on our, on our Facebook page. We can always count that uh, Dave Larson's gonna ask what, what fly do you catch them on? And, and as I've learned more and more about it, it's not the fly that matters. It's, it's the fly in the combination of the way you presented it. That, that all work together. It's a fly is a tool and, and, and th that together they work in tandem. Uh, so I believe that, that the tactics, the way you present that is way more important than the fly itself. And if you trigger that fish's uh, danger triggers, <laughs> I don't care, you could have the miracle fly and it, it's not gonna matter. So 
let's let's talk about this in in um, kind of Kirk's little Pareto about what what seems to matter in in the trout world is this is this is my experience is if your fly is in the same place as where they're eating, okay, that's the most important. If if what they're eating is skittering or not, or if it's dead, you do you want to make sure that it your fly is doing that. And that shape, size, and color are important, but not nearly as important as those others. You get them all to match and you got it. Okay, but with larger fish and more pressure, then you that then everything becomes important. Not only does it become important, is that the, the trout will then start keying on details that matter. Example: I'm at Marsh Creek on Pine Creek. It was a brown drake hatch, which is not that common. Brown drake is a huge damn mayfly. If you've ever fished Pine Creek at Marsh Creek, you know it's a big, big, slow pool. Lots of fish in there. And these fish were coming up and they were eyeing those big brown drake flies. And you'd watch them in, and they're, they're following that, that fly, just watching, watching, watching. And then you'd see the, the fly twitch, you know, his wing would twitch, and they'd eat it. They were waiting for the damn twitch. It's like, okay, what do you do? Well, we make a twitch. But that's why our, some of our friends who fish the Delaware, they're really keen on flies that have CDC in them because these flies move. They do that twitching uh, like a, a natural bug does where their, their legs move or their wings move and so forth. And the CDC moves uh, easily with that fly is following the current, okay? So that's where these unique flies and tactics get to be helpful. So what's that saying for trout? You're going out, it's stocked fish. They just been stocked, right? By the way, the bigger the fish is when it's stocked, all these danger triggers have not evolved. So if you've got a buddy and they just caught a 24 inch, you know, hold stocked fish up at Cayuta, I'm telling you, that fish is dumb as a brick because it never was acclimated to all these danger signals. And, and the DEC will tell you that those big stocked fish will be caught within days of their stocking because they're not acclimated to danger. Okay, conversely, you go down to the Delaware, the West Branch of the Delaware, where that, those fish get fly, after fly with some of the best fly fishers in the world, okay? It's, is they're gonna get super selective. Do you catch a 24 inch wild fish on the Delaware versus a 24 inch fish that was just stocked in Cayuta Creek? The challenge of those two are dramatically on each end of the spectrum, okay? And we'll talk more about that. So, um, as, so it's super important uh, with more and more pressure, as we get more and more folks in our, in our fisheries to realize that stealth deserves a really important spot in our, in our toolbox. And we can also understand that the trout don't like getting caught and they're gonna move away from where they're pressured. That's why Joe Goodspeed encourages us to go to places and fish for trout where in marginal water where they don't get fished of. And they'll feed more freely in areas that, that aren't pressured, which is counterintuitive. So going to the lower Cohocton 
might be a smart move when everybody else is fishing the opposite. Okay, switch gears. Let's talk about bass. And, and so in, in a case of smallmouth or largemouth, when they're actively feeding, bass will eat anything that is anything that's near where it's feeding. And that's been my experience. So in, in those kind of times, the, the impressionistic fig, triggers amplify. And so if your fly is in the area where it's feeding, and it seems like the bigger the fly is, the more they're going to key on it, okay? As the, and they're going to key on color and action. This is, is in a, in a, an actively feeding bass, okay? However, the bigger that fish is and the more fishing pressure means that stealth, natural, flies and tactics is going to get way more important. Is, is you've got to get the fly where it's feeding, it's got to look like what it's looking for a lot more. And so this fish you may have seen me post before. This is likely the Pennsylvania state record. It's 11 to 13 pound largemouth bass caught in Pennsylvania. I released the fish. I was not going to share where I caught it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, if you're just getting started in their sport, I want to assure you that, okay, maybe this sounded pretty complex. Um, and if it did, I, I hope that you'll only take this as an outline for the kind of knowledge building that you can have a, a lifetime of fun learning and solving problems on catching fish. And I want to assure you that you can catch fish and have fun without all this, without having all this right. And so I'd like to show this in the fly tying class. This is my first fly that I ever tied. Uh, I was 10 years old. This is a Royal Coachman. <laughs> I did not have, uh, you need a device. I didn't have a vice, so I tied this on a machinist vice. Uh, you needed all these fancy feathers, and I didn't have those, but I had pheasant feathers and thread that I could steal from my dad's pheasant and my mom's sewing, and that's my first fly. And it caught fish. I'll just remind everybody that as, as, as fisher people, we choose the tactics that we use to be sporting. We all know that if, if somehow we had to end up with fish on a dinner table tomorrow night for our family, the most effective way to do that would be to use a stick of dining. We know that. Boom, and we'd have all the fish we needed, right? Okay, but even, even bait fishermen, gear fishermen, they're all choosing a tactic because it's a challenging way to catch fish. We of the fly fishing community choose to fly fish because it's challenging to, uh, to catch fish this way. And we also, I would submit to you that with the knowledge and skill, Fly fishing can become the most effective, meaning you can catch a lot of fish when you're fly fishing. You can catch big fish, but I will assert to you, it is the funnest damn way to catch fish. Um, but the more that we learn about these, the more we can get this deeper satisfaction from fishing in challenging conditions to put ourselves in situations where we our skills require that we match these triggers and it becomes super fun. 
as we advance in our fly fishing journey, okay, as we try to catch bigger fish or in tough conditions, the thrill of it isn't, oh uh, yeah, we hammered 50 fish, but we, we, we overcame what we know was an incredible challenge because it, the, the fish had many advantages on us. So we'll fish in a spring creek, we'll fish in pressured water, we'll fish for big fish. And, and we find that, that challenging ourselves in this way and finding success is really very gratifying. So in closing, I will encourage you to catch and release and I'll invite questions. <laughs> hey Kurt, it's John. Yes, go. Hey John, so, how you doing? On on your Pareto list there, I I I think in my, you know, I, I I've always done a similar kind of thing, but there's one missing from your list, which is zero should be zero, uh, which is before you even worry about water column or color or whatever. I always make sure or try to make sure there's fish in the stream that I'm fishing. Oh, yeah, yeah, good point. You know, because especially in some of our freestone trout streams around here and with the new regs, they're going to get stocked once and could be pretty depleted. Uh, whereas others may get, you know, multiple stockings and have more fish and so on. And uh, as a beginner, you can, and, and I have, I'm sure we all have, um, spent hours, if not days, fishing over water that really held very few fish. So um, right. just offering that up as. No, no, it's a good point, uh, John. And, and, and so in, in certain types of fishing, yeah, this presentation was more getting us to think more deeply about, okay, what what causes that fish to trigger but but your point is well taken is is certain kinds of fishing you we need we all need to fish where the fish are right and um and and that becomes really critical in in certain types of fishing for example saltwater fishing it's a big damn ocean where the hell is the fish right and 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 so knowing where to find the fish becomes way, way, way important in saltwater fishing. Um, but the same could be true for tributary fishing. Um, as you pointed out for trout fishing, uh, et cetera. So it, it is a challenge um, for all of us that fish is, is to know where to find a fish. Well, point well taken and, and just to, uh, speak to the beginners in the group is uh you know fly fishing for 52 years um i i still get skunked <laughs> and 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 uh sometimes it's because i'm fishing someplace and there's no fish there and and so that but that's also part of the puzzle bill you you you've described fly fishing as the magnificent puzzle and solving magnificent problems. And I'm so endeared to that as is, um, is that's part of the intrigue of, of fly fishing is solving that, that part of the calculus, where are the fish? Um, and, and, uh, and, and I'll confess too, I've got a little case of FOMO uh, as, as I, I, I get more involved than I should with social media and you see people posting pictures of great fish here and there and all and, and and I got like all I have this kind of internal thought that every time I got to go out it's got to be an epic day and I just kind of catch gajillions of fish and perhaps Bill this is it aging and in, in, in a fly fishing uh, life is is I become more comfortable to push myself to say, okay, yeah, maybe I could take the 
here's where everybody's fishing, but I want to go and explore. And I'm going to learn something new. I'm going to try a new place. I've never fished before, but I've, I've started to target those learning goals into to my fishing outings. And so I fished some places, uh, some tributaries that I've never fished before in some places I've never fished before. And, and I've caught some fish in some places and I've seen some cool places in others, but yeah. No, good point, John. Others? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, certainly an enlightening uh, presentation. Thank you very much. I'm sure we all got a lot of it. I know I, some of the material covered, I knew about. If anybody is uh, waiting, say you wade into a trout stream or river, if you go slow, you look, you'll see some big fish going away. You'll see maybe a beach or something that's going to spook out. And the slower you go, the less they'll go away from you. So fishing is like hunting. When I'm a hunter, so when I go out, I got to be careful how I'm doing, mm -hmm. where I'm looking, what I'm doing, and it applies to fishing. And I think you learn this as the longer you fish, the more knowledge you pick up. And I think Bill, you're right, it is a big puzzle. And I, I like being part of that puzzle. And I'm not, uh, I'm going to talk to this. I think I'm the oldest dog in the group, so I qualify for it. I'll say this. I remember when the important thing for me was to catch fish. One of my greatest times was fishing for bluegills, fishing for my grandfather's cottage, going out with my dad and brothers, catching bullheads with a lantern at night. We ate everything we caught too. But the cycle of life goes on, and now I found that I'm right at the point that you're talking about, and I've been there for a while. It's not important whether I get a deer whether I shoot a pheasant, whether I catch a trout, whether I catch a bluegill, it's important that I am doing this. And yes, I'm falling in the stream more. <laughs> I'm doing some dumb things now. I can't tie my knots as well as I used to, and I know how to tie them, but the fingers don't work. I can't seem to make that happen. Mm -hmm. But it's all such a great part of the fly fishing or fishing or hunting experience. And I think we're all here because we want to, we enjoy talking about it. We could sit here until the leaves are closed and we could still be talking about it when we left in the parking. So thank you for all the good thoughts that I'll think about tonight. I may not sleep, but I'm going to group for <laughs> All right, we. Here, I'm going to group for buffalo. We got we got a football game to get to tonight. Huh? Right. The Bills are playing. But thank you for yeah. that. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, PC. Uh, unbelievable amount of work uh, to the presentation. Any, any other questions? Uh, somebody on uh, Facebook? No, not really. Nothing. No new questions on Facebook. There are a couple on the chat, but you, I think you answered them. Okay, cool. Oh, I'm uh, a little disappointed. Maybe um, can spur more questions. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's let's do it this way. Let me thank again uh, TC for for setting up. Uh, I'll I'll post a picture of of all this equipment that we have. It, it's incredible for us in the room. It, it's like. Okay, who the hell would ever thought we're, we're this never would. fly fishing club meeting and we're almost got the equivalent of a television studio here. This is like, okay, this is crazy. Everything about COVID has been crazy. <laughs> but 
but I wanted, I, I wanted to share with you is, is that um, I, I work on the, the regional board of directors and, uh, and I'm also, I've written a document on how to do virtual outreach that FFI National is, is been in the process of publishing now for over a year. So I've had a chance to kind of interact with a lot of TU clubs and FFI clubs. Uh, and I, I just have to say that uh, we're in, in our area, we're, we're one of, I think there may be another club that's doing virtual uh, programming along with, with, with in-person. Uh, we're really blessed with people like TC on our board who can help us develop these technologies and leverage them. A lot of clubs are, just don't have that kind of resource. And I, I feel very fortunate. Um, as, as we kind of end this, I, I hope to encourage you, uh, you're gonna see uh, these, the fly tying uh, for beginners and masters are gonna uh, roll out in January. If you're not a member yet, this could be a good reason to join. Um, and also uh, our fundraising will be kicking off uh, and watch for announcements there. Uh, we really need your support. Uh, we'd encourage you to look for an opportunity to, to kind of buy something that you, uh, you'd need and give a little extra dough to, uh, to the club. So with that, let me, uh, those of you in, in the Legion here, you're welcome to hang around and, and chat. Those of you on uh, virtual land, we'll wish you uh, a good evening. And uh, thanks again uh, for TC and Bob and helping us uh, pull this off. So good night, everybody. Thanks, Kirk, great talk. All this together. So, if anybody's got any uh, strength left, give them a hand going out the door. <laughs> oh, well, it's going to take a while to.